Hello again and welcome to class 5 of the Calcium Masterclass, brought to you by Shockwave and Optima Education. Today's session is all about the eccentric osteolesion, focusing on best practices. I'm joined today here in the studio by Julian Strange from the Bristol Heart Institute. Hi James and thank you very much for having me here today. It's great to be here and I'm really looking forward to the event talking to our US colleagues which is Schlolf Mitz and Alan Jeremias who will be forming a live case from St Francis Hospital in New York. And for the case Nicholas Van Meegan and Carlo De Mario will also be on the line commenting remotely. Carlo will wrap up today's session with a talk on treating eccentric cor coronary arterial calcium. But first though it's Julian's turn in the spotlight as he talks us through calcific osteal coronary disease, a different challenge. Julian, over to you. So thank you, James. I'm going to talk about aorto-osteal coronary disease and just look at why it's a little bit of a different challenge for us. In this talk, I'm going to look at some of the principles and pathophysiology, the anatomy and how that impacts on our outcomes for patients, and then just show a couple of examples at the end. So let's just start with a definition an aorta osteal lesion is one which lies within three millimeters of the ostium of the aortic orifice and it's a greater than a 50% stenosis. It tends to be seen in around about 1% of all patients who come for coronary angiography. It's almost 3% of all lesions that are treated. We tend to see it in left main stem disease in around about 20% of patients as osteal lesions only within that left main cohort of uh, uh, population. And then we see both left main and right coronary uh, osteal lesions in around about 15% of patients where you've got concomitant uh, disease in both. So what is driving this disease process? Well, most commonly it's atherosclerotic and it's seen as part of extensive diffuse disease. But occasionally we can also just see it as part of an aortic calcification. And we see it in non-atherosclerotic disease where there's aortitis or radiotherapy or previous valve surgery. And there's a slightly unusual isolated subsets predominantly in right coronary arteries and predominantly in women, which we think is probably driven by muscular uh, circumferential mass, which is driving uh, these isolated lesions. So are there specific challenges associated with uh, aorto-osteal lesions? And partly of that, is due to the fact that they're right there at the aorta ostium. We can't really image them so well. Our guide catheter doesn't sit or it goes past the lesion. They're by definition difficult to dilate. It's very difficult to position our stent. And they have high levels of restenosis. And it's not just a little bit higher. It's sometimes, and in some series, it's been reported as 10 times higher target lesion failure. So what does the histology show and how does that deliver our disease within our, or how, how does that influence in our disease and our compliance in the aorta ostium? Well, there tends to be more calcific disease at the aorta ostium compared to the more lipid pool rich in non aorta osteal lesions. And, you know, this fibrocellular matrix that we see, the increased calcification, the minimal lipid pools, it really just leads to this dramatic reduction in uh, compliance where we see that you know the more fibrosis the more calcification you get in there the less compliance there is and then you add in a fibromuscular bundle you really do start to struggle with getting your vessels to dilate let's look at these muscle bundles so the right coronary is different from the left and there's two described types of muscle bundles and you can see here in image a there's large proximal muscle bundles, and there's this subset as well where you get a circumferential muscle bundle, which is different and arises independently to the elastic muscle fibers of the aorta. And this is very different to the left main where it tends to be a continuation of these muscle uh, fibers. And how does that influence compliance? Well, there's a dramatic difference. So the right coronary ostium tends to have a much reduced compliance compared to your left main coronary ostium. So that's some of the histopathology. So let's look at the more traditional way and how we assess coronary artery lesions. This is an angiogram, obviously, and we can see here that there's an osteocircumflex lesion and a blocked right coronary artery. 
But what is being missed by this uh, angiogram is the fact that there's actually a hemodynamically significant aorta osteostenosis, and you don't see it in this view, but as we come round into a different view, it's really very obvious, and it's very obvious on a hemodynamic assessment. So yes, the angiogram can be useful, but hemodynamic assessment will tell us, should we treat that lesion? Once we've assessed, should we treat? Intravascular imaging is vital. It describes why this process has occurred. What is the etiology? How much calcium is there? It delineates the true osteum, and that's important because we can see quite extensive funneling in these lesions. And the issue with that is if you're going to take a four millimeter stent, you're not going to be able to dilate it up into a very extensively funneled osteum, which is 10 millimeters in diameter. So you'll be able to define your optimal landing zone, choose your appropriate stent, and we know that when we use IVUS, like many other lesions, we're going to get a massive reduction in target lesion failure or target lesion revascularization compared to non-IVUS or non-imaged vessels or treatments. So what else does IVUS imaging or intravascular imaging afford us? Well, it allows us to decide what other adjuncts we need to optimally treat these lesions. So could, this may well be balloon-based, non-compliant, OPN, cutting balloons, debulking with rotablation or orbital atherectomy or intravascular lithotripsy. And you can see here a great example of napkin ring calcification, which is commonly seen in these heavily diseased aorta osteal lesions. And all of these adjuncts have advantages and disadvantages, and it's worth understanding, and we've gone through this multiple times, which is the best uh, adjunct for the type of uh, lesion that you're going to be treating. Stent deployment, this is a challenge. And here you can see in this diagram an aorta osteal plane, which is very easy to draw in a diagram like this. It's very easy to see on CT imaging. It's very hard to see in a cath lab. We don't get this beautiful cross-sectional image. And what we know is there's an optimal landing zone, which is called the aorta osteal landing zone, which is one millimeter either side of the aorta osteal plane. The problem is, the angulation of our coronary arteries, they don't come off in a nice right angle. And the more obtuse the angle, the more challenging it is for us to deliver our stents appropriately. What we do know is that there's some anatomically dependent geographical misses where the angles are great, but you're still lying the majority of your stent within the aorto osteal landing zone. And there's some procedural failures where actually you've missed completely. So you're outside of that optimal landing zone area. And you can see that on the right where the stent is protruding either too far or too deep into the vessel. And do we do this? Yes, we do. And we do this often. So this is a great study by Rubenstein. And it was only 23 patients where they looked at geographical miss following aorta osteal stenting. And they use CT to image. So here we can see optimal deployment and obviously uh, two failures on the right. And you know, this was anatomically dependent, you know, where the angles were too great in around about 60% of cases, but procedurally dependent in 40%, so operator dependent. So what is driving target lesion failure at such a high rate? Well, Kimoto's group were looking at this and they have got three main drivers of stent failure. Stent under expansion, proximal stent overlap, and excessive aortic stent protrusion. And if you have a combination of all three of these, we're gonna get target lesion revascularization or target lesion failure at a rate of about 70% at one year. So this is hugely impactful on our patients. So are there ways or strategies that we can improve our accuracy of our stent positioning? Well, potentially, yes. We can use CT or IVUS and fusion during a case or devices, for example, like OsteoPro. That will help us visualize our aorta osteal plane. Sometimes it will help us control our catheters or our guide catheters to improve stability, but there's also techniques, for example, the Zabo wire technique, where you put a wire behind a stent cell or take a secondary wire into the coronary sinus. I don't particularly like those. Or some novel designs for the Capella stent, which allows flaring of the osteum or the flash osteal balloon system, which does that for you. It takes a normal stent and can expand it out with this unique design. 
When we deploy our stents, we also must be careful. When you use two wires, you can sometimes or commonly get longitudinal stent deformation. And what we're starting to see with the use of more imaging and measuring our stent lengths is we can get elongation of our stents with POT. So this is a left main example. You have two wires, you've deployed the stent obviously on one and you have, for example, a gelled circumflex wire. And as you pull that out, you can deform and compress your aorta ostium. This is an elongation, so here's a stent left main LAD. I'm just taking my time to deploy this accurately, trying to make sure that I'm hitting my aorta osteal landing zone. The stent's either too deep, I'm bringing it back, that's probably a little bit too far out. And I'm actually pretty happy where I've deployed this 3.5 by 33 millimeter stent. I'm then gonna take a 5.0 millimeter balloon having assessed on IVUS imaging and pot firstly at the carina and then come back and pot at the ostium. And then I've measured my length of my stent, which is, remember is a 33 millimeter stent, and I've elongated with this potting uh, technique. And I've now got a 37 and a half millimeter stent, and my stent is now landed outside of the aorta ostium by this four millimeter length. It's a bit of a poor result. So let's just have a look at a couple of examples. This is a 79-year-old lady with good going symptoms, diabetes and hypertension, preserved LV, and this is her diagnostic coronary angiogram which shows this severe right coronary artery lesion. I've got poor guide support, typical for aorta osteo lesions, and I'm unable to deliver anything on my workhorse wire, so I'm then having to take in a rotor floppy wire. I'm unable to cross a lesion with any devices, so I'm gonna rotablate I'm going to use a 125 millimeter burr. And here you can see after quite a long, prolonged attempt, I'm just gently tapping away and eventually that burr passes. It's quite a bit of a relief for having achieved this. And then I'm going to image. An image is going to determine what further adjuncts I need. Have I got good disruption of my calcium? I'm going to get a good result from my stent. And no, I need a shockwave balloon, so I'm going to take a 2.5 millimeter shockwave and deliver 80 pulses along the length of this artery. Here you can see the expansion of the balloon with delivery of the shock wave. And then again, I'm gonna re-image and as I come back, so there are visible fractures now that I can see. However, I'm still concerned that I haven't disrupted the ostium enough. I haven't modified the osteal disease enough. So I'm gonna go in and use a 3-5 Wolverine balloon Sorry, this is a 3 by 15 Wolverine. This goes up. And you can see with inflation, it doesn't look too bad in this view, but as I shift my view over into a spider view in a second, there's a suspicion of a more proximal waste. And in this, in this different view, the LEO caudal position, I think it's more obvious that there is a waste. So, Shockwave again, this is a three millimeter shockwave. And this is deployed at the ostium. And we're delivering around about 40 pulses here. And having good confirmed good expansion with one-to-one -one non-compliant balloons, we deploy our stents and we get a fantastic final result in this patient. Second case, this is a patient who's already been treated. And if we just go back and think of what's gonna drive failure of stenting, this gentleman has it all. So first, he's 80 years old. He's got a history of hypertension. Found about a year ago, he had an end stemmy, had three stents put in in a referring hospital. These stents were not particularly well deployed at all. Firstly, they were underexpanded. there was proximal overlap, and there was protrusion of the stent out into the autoostium. So all the drivers of early stent failure. And then all the challenges of having a protruding stent. So how am I going to deal with this? I've used the workhorse wire and I've passed this through the side struts. This allows me to gain stability of my guide. And then I can take a secondary workhorse wire and deliver that down the coronary. We're now able to take an angiographic image and this is the first shot that we see. We see not only aorta osteo target lesion failure, 
but we see restenosis as well in the mid vessel, and this is at another position of stent overlap, and there's probably stent fracture there. Intravascular imaging obviously is going to help determine what is the mode of failure, and we can see under expansion here, a small stent in a large vessel, and then as we work further back up the artery, we're going to see at this overlap of stent quite a lot of movement, and there is a suspicion on the IVUS imaging that there's stent fracture. So here's our restenosis coming up in a second. And then as we come back further, we're going to see some of the other drivers of failure. There's nodular calcification, under expansion. So here's the restenosis area, the overlapping stents, quite a lot of movement here. Coming back, we're going to see more calcification, under expansion again. And then it will be useful to see, have I actually entered the stent through uh, the, the um, ostium of the stent or come through the side struts? And as you come back proximally, you'll see at 3 o'clock that the stent goes off and actually I've come through the side struts. It's not really of any significance, but maybe just useful to understand if we have any difficulties in delivering the equipment. So here, back to the ostium, stent under expansion, heavy deep wall calcification, and there's my stent going off to three o'clock. Following proper adequate preparation using cutting balloons, non-compliant balloons, three millimeter shockwave balloons, I'm then able to deploy two Megatron stents and get an excellent angiographic result in this patient. It's just a shame that it had to occur a second time. And what's happened to our old stent is being pushed out of the way. So I hope I've given a good summary of aorta osteal disease, some of the challenges, how the pathology and anatomy is driving some of these major issues that we have with aorta osteal disease, the need to focus on lesion preparation and trying to really optimize your stent deployment. And there are still challenges which we don't have clear solutions for. And what we need to do is to work to try and resolve these. Thank you very much. So Julian, that was great. It's a really a topic you don't hear about that frequently. So you've really deep dived into it. What have you kind of extracted in terms of your own personal practice? Yeah, I mean, th thanks, James. Uh, it's, it's a problem, and it's a problem we don't recognize. And I, it's hard to understand why we haven't recognized it more. And maybe it's because we don't have the tools or the ability in a cath lab to modify the behavior to really nail the aorta ostium and deal with it properly. Mm -hmm. Uh, certainly, historically, I haven't been taught about it. I've only picked it up in my own practice due to failures and trying to work out why have I failed or why have patients come back early with aorta osteal lesions and what can I do to try and improve the outcome. So calcium at the ostium, I mean, ahead of lithotripsy, what were the options like? Uh, so it's limited and, you know, I think our whole ability to deal with calcium was limited and, and now that lithotripsy has come along, we're looking at it more, we're trying to understand it more, we've got different options and it's, it's this ability to use different options that has now driven us to really focus on aorta ostiums, I believe. So cutting balloons and rotablations, which are traditional, but the deep wall calcification, which we see and really have challenges with in the aorta ostium. You know, this may be an absolute nugget for, nugget's an interesting word, but an absolute focus for a uh, shockwave to be able to deal with. Okay, and rotational arthrectomy, you can, of course, use rotational arthrectomy at an ostium. You know, talk, talk me through that. Yeah, well, these are four and a half millimeter vessels. It's not going to touch the sides. Even with slowing down your rotablation rates, trying to get as much reverberation as possible, you, you just need more. You need ability to get into this deep wall. And th the issue with the support, I presume that's a bit of a, one of the problems around rotational atherectomy and potential you know, guide prolapse, etc. Yeah, I mean, guides are a challenge. They're either going to be too much, too little, and you're never going to have a perfect option. Guide extensions are really useful in this, uh, not only for increasing your support to be able to prepare the lesions properly, but for stent deployment, an ability to be able to back your guide extension in and out to really define the aorta osteal plane is really very useful. Yeah, and it's not all about calcium osteolesions, of course. I mean, one thing I found very interesting in your talk was that 
you've got this real morphological change between the right and the left. And how does that translate to strategy and equipment choice? Yeah, I never understood why the right seemed to be so difficult. And actually, you dig back, and there's a reason. It's these muscular planes. And it's uh, we're going to have to treat it differently. Cutting balloons, yes, are useful. You know, we need to disrupt this fiber muscular layer. And we need to do it in a controlled way. So cutting balloons along with shockwave are going to be potentially very useful moving forwards. And the recoil, is that a big problem at the osteum? Yes, it is. You know, and this is where this muscular layer is really driving failure as well. Um, we see it not only at the aorta osteums, but circumflex osteums as well. I think improved stent design, thicker struts, greater radial strength is what we need. Sometimes we try and get around that by using two stent layers, and I don't think that's really you know, very appealing. Having a single stent design that has thicker struts, better long uh, um, better radial strength is going to be vital. Okay, so I'm going to introduce a concept which you may have heard before of iatrogenic hazard. It seems to me that iatrogenic hazard is more of a risk at the osteum. Could you just talk our viewers through what, what your understanding of that term is and what is the hazard about standing near the osteum in terms of how you can make that worse? Yes, yeah, so when we deploy a stent and we miss and we don't recognize it, we are potentially delivering a very bad outcome for our patient. And it's, it's understanding as the physician dealing with the patient, what are we doing? And how can we use all the tools that we have? So Julian, I'd like to introduce a term to iatrogenic hazard, where the physician can actually, after, or as part of the procedure, actually increase the downstream risk to the patient. Now that seems to me from your talk to be higher in osteo lesions. You can actually maybe take a lesion which is only physiologically intermediate, put a stent in, and then what can happen downstream if you're not careful? Yeah, no, so absolutely. Uh, um, longitudinal stent compression or elongation can lead to worse outcomes for patients. So compression of a stent at the aorta ostium is surprisingly easy. And if you go an image, you can see that how commonly we do do that. And it's the hazards of having two wires or having a supportive guide or trying to get potting balloons back into a, a, a coronary ostium and not having everything aligned beautifully. You have to take a lot of care with these lesions or else you're going to be driving failure and early failure rates in your patients. Yeah, and it's great to talk about that and, and many thanks for your excellent talk, Julian. It's now time for our yes, live mate. case discussion. Before we go over to New York, I'd like to introduce Nicholas Van Megan and Carlo DiMario. Great to have you both here. Good to be here. Good to see you. And now over to St. Francis Hospital in New York, where we hope to find Richard Schlopmitz and Alan Jeremias. Richard, Alan, can you hear us? Absolutely. Hey, guys. Great. Good How's afternoon. How are you? Very good, thanks. Great to see you both. Thank so you. We've got a very oh, illustrious to... panel, guys. We've got um, Nicholas Van Meegen from Rotterdam and Carlo De Mario from Florence. And Julian Strange is with me in the studio. So. Really looking forward to seeing the case, guys, and uh, hear you talk through this technology. Great. I'm sure it's going to be a great discussion. Let me introduce the, the team here at San Francis. Uh, the, we're here with uh, Catherine, and we have a, an amazing team um, uh, with uh, Rachel. Rachel. Uh, we have Anesthesia, Mike, um, and of course, we have uh, Craig, who is our imaging and physiology expert and, and really um, uh, a major contributor to the success of our program. So let me introduce the case briefly. We have a few slides prepared for you guys. Next Brilliant. slide, please. So this is an 89-year-old gentleman um, who presented to us uh, a couple of weeks ago with unstable angina, complaints of progressive anginal uh, discomfort over the period of four weeks or so. He has a history of uh, CAD, had stents to the LAD in the past and multiple other um, coronary risk factors. And we did a cath, um, as I said, a couple of weeks ago. Next slide. And so this is what his anatomy is. His EF is around mm. 50 or so. The right is relatively small and non-dominant. Next slide. The LAD stents are patent, That's but what he has is this, this huge um, dominant circumflex with very, very uh, calcified and, and what appears to be significant proximal disease, oh, proximal and, and osteal uh, disease of that, uh, of that circumflex. So the plan was to um, bring him back today and um, do 
um, some basic imaging and physiology and then kind of decide on the strategy, um, in particular on the calcium modification strategy. Next slide. Um, and maybe, Rich, you want to spend a minute or so, if you guys don't mind. Uh, we're just going to kind of go over the algorithm that we use yeah, at sure. St. Francis here to kind of treat calcium. So, you know, uh, over the last 10 years at St. Francis Hospital, we have 20 interventional cardiologists, and we've adopted a very systematic physiologic and imaging algorithmic approach to all of angioplasty, not just complex lesions. This is our algorithm of calcified lesions, but basically we don't, think of a type A lesion until you image. So many times we're shocked to see that something that we thought was straightforward, in fact, was not in terms of bifurcation, osteolesion. So imaging to us is a critical part of success with angioplasty. It takes the mystery out of angioplasty. And right now we're at 95% of our cases have imaging and or physiology. For specifically for calcified lesions, I find it angiographically is inadequate to assess calcium. Um, we know that calcium can be deep, superficial, or nodular, and we have so many wonderful technologies now to modify that calcium. So instead of struggling with a stent and having instant restenosis, we try to modify calcium beforehand and using an algorithm approach, try to pick the best technology, whether it be rotablator, orbital atherectomy, shockwave, or balloon technology. And the approach we use with OCT is that if we can cross with an OCT catheter, we absolutely can determine the three types of calcium, which I would tell you is virtually impossible by an angiogram to differentiate between deep superficial and nodular. If um, we have superficial calcium, um, measure the calcium, the depth of the calcium, the length of the calcium, and um, the arc of the calcium. And if in fact it's greater than 180 degrees in arc and greater than five millimeters in length and 0.5 millimeters in depth, we find that balloon um, technology alone is not going to be adequate all the time. And we then go right to some type of ablative technique, whether it be um, lithotripsy or CSI or rotablate, it depends on many different factors. We are developing an algorithm to help tell people when or assist people when to use which technology. Since we have 80 pulses for a lithotripsy catheter, and in the US it's quite costly, costly if we have diffuse disease, we might go for a, uh, a different type of ablative technique. If we have nodular lesions, we might go for CSI, which works quite well. And we know with uh, IVL, the more calcium you have, the better results you get. But what's great about imaging with calcium ablation, especially for lithotripsy, is that we want to get one-to-one -one measurement. And angiographically frequently undersizes the real size of the vessel. And we get really good one-to-one -one management with uh, imaging for lithotripsy, and we use something that we call pulse management. If you have a long lesion, you want to use your pulses where you need them the most. So if you have 80 pulses and you have two areas that are heavily calcified, we can focus on those areas rather than wasting energy in areas that are not as calcified. On the far right, you'll see if we can't cross with an OCT and we need a ablative technique with rotablator or orbital atherectomy, those are great, but we always document fracture before we put a stent in, because the fact that you use a technology doesn't mean that you got the result that you wanted. So we use this to help us determine when it's right to stent. And that's how we try to approach every case. I mean, that's a great summary, Richard. I think that systematic approach to percutaneous intervention is something that we don't slay as much as we should do. And I think that everybody on this call uh, definitely supports an imaging-based strategy. So. Really excited to see what you've got uh, on offer today angiographically. I think there's lots of questions, but let's start with the angiogram plus or minus imaging, and Craig, then we can Craig, take it from there. Guys, let's put the angio on. So why don't we put the angio up from today? This is it. And the, why, you, why don't you guys weigh in on what you guys would suggest yeah, we should so, do? So, so listen, we have a lot of expertise in this call. So I'm going to start with Nicholas. Nicholas, I'm going to talk here about goals of uh, therapy here. So the guys are, have got an elderly gentleman who's had previous revask. You can see the de proximal disease. You can see it's a dominant circ and he's got this subtotal occlusion stroke CTO into the left PDA. What would your goal of this particular intervention be? 
And my goal in this case would be, well, first of all, you see a tandem lesion in the proximal segment, uh, all the way uh, starting at the ostium of that cirque, and then uh, going into, I think, 20 to 25 millimeters into the vessel. That would be my primary target. Uh, I would not waste too much time and contrast uh, on that uh, on that posterior lateral branch that there distally. So, and, and I would agree with this strategy of uh, imaging. So we also would uh, approach this with OCT in order to refine our strategy because now we have this armamentarium of uh, calcium modification. And uh, I think it's important that you make the right choices here. And uh, if you, uh, it depends on how, how it looks by this imaging uh, by OCT, but you might, you might be able to get away with um, with with lithotripsy and and be done in, in thirty minutes or twenty minutes. If uh, mm. it depends on the imaging, but I, I would agree with the strategy of imaging. Yeah, guys, we have to fill it now. Would... Remember. <laughs> so that's why I'm a little bit lengthy in my answer <laughs> because I know you can do this in ten minutes. But uh, and I think I would I would restrict myself to the first twenty millimeters. Okay, so I mean, guys, I think, you know, it, it, I guess let's see the OCT and then we can kind of develop the discussion further right. because I think we can't go against the two great arguments we've heard already. Let's, let, we can modulate our treatment based on what the imaging tells us. Right, but before we do the OCT, just before we went live, uh, because I have Dr. Jeremiah standing next to me and he taught me how to do physiology <laughs> and makes me do physiology all the time, we're going to bore you with some physiology first. Not Would anybody all. do physiology in this case or no? I mean, the, the clinical presentation is pretty convincing. The proximal cert looks pretty high grade. The left PDA is, if it's viable, it's ischemic. So I'm not sure I would do uh, physiology here. Julian, thoughts? I mean, it's difficult. I, I think it's sometimes in these very challenging cases and there's a high jeopardy case, it's IMR? useful to get that little bit of extra information to yeah. drive it what you're going to do. Does it? No, and it makes you feel more comfortable. We're going to be treating a target. We're going to make sure that that target is, is needed to be treated. Yeah, I think the most important thing the physiology is telling you here, Alan, and I'm sure you'll correct me if I'm wrong, is that if we're not treating the left PDA, is that distal vascular bed, you know, sufficient enough to cause ischemia and you've certainly looks like you've answered that question yeah well the other reason why i like to use it frankly is not to determine necessarily whether or not there is a significant lesion i think i agree with you guys based on the clinical presentation and the angiogram i'd be shocked you know obviously if it was if it wasn't um, abnormal what really is is in my opinion very very helpful is to do a pullback a resting index pullback in this case we used ifr maybe we can show the next one and when you do the pullback you can actually see mm -hmm. where the step up is which is very, very important mm -hmm. in terms of how you plan your procedure to really stent the lesion um, that has the biggest gradient, if you will. You get the biggest bang for your buck. And if you want to make this even more fancy, you can actually um, co-register with an angiogram, a technology called Sync Vision. I'm sure you guys know well. Yeah. Um, and that really kind of is an interesting picture here because now we see that really the majority of the gradient is at this osteal um, circumflex, maybe a little bit in the left main. So, yes. and it allows you also to kind of measure how long of a stent you plan on using mm -hmm. if you want to cover the entire lesion. In this case, I think it's 33 or so, 34 millimeters based on the sync vision. Yeah, I think that's really okay. helpful information, Alan, because we talked about the goals of procedural goals at the start. And I think while strategy can change based on what OCT. happens very procedurally, if you don't start off with a clear goal, you're not going to get to the, the same position. So. Uh, we'll have a look at the OCT and then we'll ask Carlo what his okay. thoughts are subsequent on that. So we're going to OCT now and the new catheter and the new software that's coming out is quite nice. Um, I love OCT in that it really gives you such precise information. So we're going to do that right now. I'll let you know when. I always go manual. Now. It takes a couple of seconds for it to... Uh, Register there. Okay. What do you think of that run so far, guys? We're, we're putting Carlo was in it, charge of the OCT comments. Carlo, do you think it was clear that run? Well, I saw a bit of blood just at the end over here, uh, but, but near the, the guiding, but I don't think it's so uh, essential. The, I, I guess the plaque has been reasonably well 
shown, and if you just, okay, now you are through the uh, lesion, you see the calcium, and now you are in the guide. So, so I'm going to do another run. Carlo, I just wanted to bring one interesting point. Give me a new run here. Carlo, that was a saline OCT, by the way. Wow. Mm -hmm. wow. It was all, all saline. So I just wanted to show you in a large vessel in the mm -hmm. circ, that was a saline run. So I'm going to do one more approximately. That's why it wasn't as clear. Wait, but, that's impressive, yeah. I'm going to do another saline. So for my renal insufficiency patients, I usually use four cc's of contrast at the end just to make sure there's no perf. Now... Again, this is a saline run, just closer to the left main. You know, if you have to do several runs, it's not a big deal since it's saline. You can see a little bit the speckle, you know, within yeah. within the lumen, but really the mm -hmm. quality of the imaging is, yeah, I yeah. think, spectacular. Yeah. Yeah, so for right fine. coronary circumflex, LED, I usually have to do two runs, but we frequently use in anyone with renal insufficiency, we do saline OCT. It's mm, good to see. And this is a new caster, so Richard. It's not the new software, is that correct? That's correct. So we don't have that in the U.S. yet. And was this a manual pullback? Did you say that? Yeah. I always do manual because even when I'm using contrast, I never use automatic because what I like to do is I gauge it with my guide. I always try to get the best OCT run I can get. I like to say a bad OCT run is like Ivis. And um, <laughs> what, 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 what I do is I wait to see that my... Ignore that, guys. <laughs> what I like to do is I make sure that my guide is in the left main, that I see the um, blood completely um, gone and the contrast filling it before I tell the person next to me to activate the run. If you do it automatically, it could activate early and you could pop out. So we really try to get the best runs with the least contrast. We're very contrast conscious here. And uh, whether we do it with saline or minimal runs, but I use much less contrast than a typical person doing angiography because I'll take maybe two or three um, pre runs with an angiogram and then I go to imaging. I'd rather see 360 degrees of my vessel rather than mm -hmm. a two dimensional view. Yeah, and so what is the flow rate the, uh, of, the, of the saline? The flow rate? It's, it's quite it's a powerful hand, hand injection. It, it's a yeah. Schlafmitz flow it's rate. A, it's yeah. a Schlafmitz flow rate. It, it's, not that strong. it's not that strong because it's from me. You know? it's, 20, so, it's a 20 cc uh, so saline. Let's go to the OCT. And we always do OCT in a very systematic approach. What's great, and the new software will add other things, but what it, we, we look for where the minimum, minimum MLA is uh, minimal luminal area, and then we go distal to find a good landing zone and proximally. And you see right now we're going to measure our distal landing zone, and we put our marker there, which is around like at the four on the uh, panel over there. And then we go proximally and we find the landing zone proximally. Here, we're probably gonna go to the origin of the left main, as you'll see. But let's just scan and look at the calcium. You see some calcium on the right side of the screen there. It gets more significant. And this is the beauty of OCT with shockwave in that I can focus with co-registration exactly where I wanna give my pulses and how many pulses. And that matters when you have diffuse disease. Now we're getting close to where the, the right over here, you see it's heavily calcified. Right. And you're gonna see the wire come in and some struts from the left main on the far right there. And you see calcium starting around 12, around one o'clock circumferentially going around in that circumflex. So we're going to have to um, use calcium in the left main. Too, right. right. So uh, our strategy, I think, is going to be that we're going to use shockwave in the proximal circ and then back in the ostium of the circ into the left main and measure it out. Um, I think when we measure it on the other run, it comes out to probably 30 or 34 because we're going to want to land in that meaty part of the circ with a 4-0. It measures as a 4-0. And we'll go from the ostium of the left main to this mid circ or proximal mid circ and then see if we have to cross over into the LED. Yeah, that makes sense, Richard. And I think what, sometimes when you have a circ osteal disease, you think of nodular calcium. It's quite, a, it's quite a common area for nodular calcium, but it looked pretty concentric in most of the areas there. Carlo, any thoughts on the yeah. OCT run? Well, I mean, I, first of all, technically, I'm very impressed that you can achieve a similar clear image uh, just with saline injection. <clears throat> uh, I, I, believe that having a you know, viscous uh, contrast could uh, um, achieve much better images, but I confess, uh, uh, looking at this, uh, I think I'll try next time. Uh, maybe I need uh, a bit of uh, stronger breakfast <laughs> than usual to have uh, this uh, strength of injection. Yeah, but, uh, it was excellent. Uh, uh, one point that well, was raised by, 
Richard was uh, automatic or manual, Richard and the thing there was somewhat of a misunderstanding. Is not that he was doing a manual pullback of the OCT catheter. No, no. It's the I'm way talking about activation. Uh, yeah. Put the system in, uh, yeah. in, in a setting uh, you can have automatic or manual, and you can ask the system to recognize when there is blood clear, or you can do it yourself. I do like. Uh, Richard, I always do it myself. I want to see the blood clear, and then I start. Right. The exactly. Yeah, exactly. Very fast. Exactly. So, so let, let, listen, Richard, a question that pop comes to mind, because I know uh, St. Francis is a very big OCT center, and sometimes those of us who are not imaging enthusiasts, and, and that's no one on this uh, particular panel, give efficiency as a reason for not doing imaging. I'm sure you're very well placed to address that question. Any, any thoughts on that? Yeah. Right. So when, when people tell me why they don't use OCT, when I lecture about OCT, these are the things people say. It takes too much time. There's too much radiation. There's too much contrast. Um, and it's, it's too expensive. Well, first of all, we're very, very busy here and we image everybody. It takes less time because there is no mystery. I know beforehand exactly what technology I need. I know exactly the length of the stent, and I know how to optimize afterwards. We do our optimization before our final imaging. When we do our final imaging to see if there's dissection, luminal gain, and stent apposition, we're almost never surprised because we prepared ourselves beforehand. There is no mystery, so we're not asking for one thing after another. We know if we're landing in a lipid plaque to extend it. We don't want to land in superficial calcium. So we're putting in longer stents and less stents. So we're saving money, we're saving time, and we don't use extra contrast. Yeah, that's a great answer, Richard. So, Nicholas, kind of, I mean, Erasmus has been at the forefront of interventional cardiology. What is your perspective on interventional imaging? Do you, do you think it should be as applied as systematically as, as Richard is just suggesting? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's also our practice these days. Um, we, whenever it's possible and feasible, uh, we will do it. You know, sometimes patients are unstable or there are some arguments to, to, to be more... Uh, to go less invasive with the imaging, but in principle, this is our default strategy too. So either sure. IVIS or OCT, but we still also, it depends on the on the type of patients we have. So for osteo left mains and for patients with kidney issues, we would prefer IVIS, but otherwise OCT yeah. is our, is our um, imaging tool. You want to go, go forward to. just a little? But yeah. I think it's 70% of our PCI cases is with uh, imaging guided. Yeah, and I think there are nuances within the imaging subset. You know, as you say, the CTO population is perhaps better served by IVIS. There, IVIS there's yeah. definitely a, a lack or, of left main data for OCT, and I'm sure, you know, something will come into into that void. Oh, that pop. And what about um, did you guys, did you guys yeah, see that? Was, oh, yeah, did. We, we just did our second run. Yeah. We just did our second run at 20 uh, pulses. The mid circ popped. Yeah. So we got rid of the dog yeah, bone mean, at 20, which is nice. Let me see if I can show you that actually it was kind of. I think we. Uh, it was impressive. Wait one second. You just saw the cavitation bubble, and then it expanded. Look, look at yeah. this. So this yeah. is this is how it looks, right? And then it just suddenly pops. There you go. Nice. Nice. <laughs> So, you know, the question is, and we're looking at this at St. Francis, we've done over 100 um, shockwaves here, all with imaging before, um, after the shockwave and, and after stents. So we do three runs, just like we did for the, um, mm -hmm. for the um, study that we participated in. Yeah. And what we're looking at is how do people know when you're done? Mm -hmm. With orbital atherectomy and CSI, we know it by feel and by sound. And here it's not just balloon expansion. We're not sure, but we always image before we're going to end up um, putting us dented to see if, in fact, we got um, fracture and expansion. I'm going to do one more. Um, you uh, want to do one here? I'll do one more here, and then the I'm going to come back the to the left mate, because okay. we have plenty of, uh, we have 60 pulses left, so. Four. And I think there, you know, Carlo you is talking a bit later on this, but um, there is a dose dependency in terms of pulse management, that you get more fractures that, that you know, depending on the number of pulses that you deliver. So, so it, I, I'm not sure we've, totally address that question about pulse management. It's probably not as, as, right here. as right crude here and as just does, is the balloon expanded or not. It may well be that there is a relationship between visible fractures and vascular compliance. So you can see you've got a degree of under expansion there as well in your osteo of your circ. Yeah. And one thing to mention, I don't know, you, if you can't see our screen right now, but we have these uh, shock pulses mm. that we see, all, you know, most of the time. Shock and topics, that Richard. doesn't have any, 
Yes, exactly. And uh, it doesn't actually clinically have any uh, effect in our experience. No, no, we, uh, we described that about, I think, about a year ago, 18 months ago. Um, and I think it is like one of these unusual epi phenomenons where you actually get electrical capture and you can actually get yeah, mechanical yeah. capture at the same time. Sometimes you get this kind of slight decrease in systolic so pressure, but I'll of course it's and come, come completely dependent do, on do the pulses. So know, you, you don't right pulse, you don't get it. I know. That's it, that's it, that's it. Yeah, perfect. Maybe go forward a tad okay. or no? Yeah. So what we're trying to yep. do is... As no, because I'm four millimeter. And just to make a point, there are two markers on the balloon. It's a 12 millimeter balloon. Yeah. And the emitters are four millimeters in approximately two millimeters distally. So we adjust that as well. So, so we try to basically yeah. align the emitters to where the maximal calcium is on the, on the OCT. Yeah. So we're in the left main now. So we'll see um, how many... And the beauty of um, shockwave with bifurcation lesions in left main is that you can wire both vessels very confidently down. So that gives us a lot of confidence when we're doing these complex cases. Yeah, absolutely. You don't have to, and of course, this is essentially a left main case that um, you're going to have to extend back into left main here. So, so we, it's, it's much nicer we'll having here. the LED wire in place. Gives me a lot more comfort. Come back a little after. Mm -hmm. the like the result. Mm, that's right. Oh, no. Never mind. What do you want to do? It looks fabulous. Well. Yeah. 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 So that's the angio there. It looks pretty impressive, actually. Does, Did you see that? It does, yeah. Right yeah. Uh, and now we'll do an OCT. Have you guys been using CSI there in, um, yet? Well, we haven't in the UK. It's literally just arriving. Nicholas, I think, has had some experience. Yeah, yeah so it was launched in, uh, in February in Europe. Uh -huh. And uh, actually, it is, it is also a valuable, a ver a valuable option for uh, for a significant number of patients, yeah. What I really like about it, I've been doing it um, since the study came out, and I, I really have a f large experience with it. What I love it is with imaging with nodule lesions. I really give those nodules a haircut. If you're in a large, <laughs> you know, when you have a, a nodule, you're not going to get that pinned against the wall unless you shave that off. And in a large vessel, it may not be clinically significant, but as you get smaller, it does make a difference. And for nodular lesions, we always use CSI, and it, it really gives you a really nice, gratifying circumferential, um, a nice circle for your post. You know, you, you calcified lesions, you want to do it right the first time because mm -hmm. you never can get it right afterwards. Yeah. Okay. You mentioned nodular calcium, Richard. I, I still have to thank you because you advised me in a patient of mine, a, the, the mother of a staff member of my team, to go for a orbital atheritomy one and a half year ago. I used it on a compassionate use. I believe it was one of the very best cases in Europe because it was not CMAT and it was a beautiful result, I confess. So Great. thanks again. My pleasure. Okay, so now we're going to look for, a, we look for fracture, landing zones, length. And we'll find a good landing zone, put our marker there. There's a little, you want to go back a little, there's a little the section there. Okay. And sometimes we find that the size gets bigger and the length gets longer, so we love to measure um, if we can afterwards here. So let's go now look for fracture. If you can scan down, and we're going to look to see where we have fracture in the calcium. There, there you have some impressive fracture right there. Over there you have around 5 o'clock. Again, there's multiple areas, and now we're going to get back to the calcified areas here where you have nice fracture. And we're going yeah, to get back into the left main. Look at the, if you look at the, MS, uh, the MLAs now, I mean, look at the osteum. I, I, do you recall what it was? It was like two or something? It we're was, up to like six? Right. Just with a four mm -hmm. atmosphere balloon. Yeah, it's pretty you, impressive. You, you crack, it's circumferential. You crack yeah. it in one location. It's like, it's like opening a ring, right? That's yeah. nice. So... And now we're going to measure the size of our stent and the length, and then uh, we'll 30, use co-registration. Four will be good yeah. here, I think, right? So and we'll see. It's a 4034. It's a 4 good. 4 so we'll do a 4034 stent. Richard, can I just ask you quickly about uh, saline? Because it's something that's becoming topical uh, with OCT. Do you purge the catheter with contrast or saline? So, oh, in, in the catheter, yeah. is, I'd use contrast. Right. Contrast. Okay. Mm-hmm. 
but that's outside the body, so it's not really... No, no, uh, sure. And, you know, I think the new software, what I've seen of it so far is that you can um, uh, change the settings for individual operators to say, what are you going to use? So you can preset that as you go into contrast, half saline or saline. And I think we're right. going to see a lot more of this as we move forwards over the next short period of time with the software coming mainstream. So the measurement of the size of the vessel is different with um, saline versus contrast, but... Um, Ziad Ali and my son Evan had done a study showing that it really was not a tremendous difference. So whatever number you have, you could basically go with. It's not really uh, clinically significant. And it's under, undersizing it a little bit, which is so you're not going to be oversizing a stent, which obviously mm -hmm. is important yeah. in terms of safety. It's pretty nice, actually. I like this one. Right. I would maybe come back yeah. a tad. Come back. So you have a little, you want to have a, the eight, eight millimeters to pot, right? Yeah, I or definitely want to come, come back. back a little okay. bit. That's good. That's nice. A little more, actually. So I I do a poor man's co-registration. I don't use what the company does with their formal co-registration. I use the lens marker with a which is a black dot, and in the new technology, it's I think that's good. In the new technology it lends you right cross sectionally where you see your cross section is. And uh, it really is quite nice. You just have to know what stent you're putting in down. You just have to know if you're using a Medtronic, an Abbott, or Boston stent because the markers are different. On the Abbott stent, uh, the markers are exactly where the stent are. In a Medtronic, they're off by a little. Hmm. So next step from here, Richard, is post dilatation, I presume? Yes, and right. then we're going to we're image both. And, and any time I have a bifurcation lim lesion, I always image both segments. So we're going to image the LED as well as the circ. Okay, and that was one of the questions that I was thinking about. And Nicholas, you know, you've got a stent in the proximal LED here. You, you, you'd be recrossing and post dilating it, yes. I guess. Correct. I mean, it's almost a pseudo cloth already. It's just there's a little maybe. So a little far, it looks pretty, gap it's pretty nice. Yeah. <laughs> it's looking pretty good so far. There shouldn't be a gap, actually. A little bit of the stent, the LED was stent into, strut was coming main. back to the left main. I need another uh, Xion white across okay. Yeah. On the first image, we saw the. Uh, my main concern would be the ostium of that yeah. left main. Likewise. Yeah. It looks, it looks like a little hazy there. Micro deception yeah. or something there, doesn't it? Yep, yeah. you're absolutely right. Yeah. We may have to put a short stent in there. You're absolutely right. Yeah. And honestly, I would, uh, if you know, if you do your, that's the that's the beauty of the of your invasive imaging. You will cross that ostium of that left of the LED as well, so you will be able to visualize it. You have your wire there, so if it would look good by OCT, I would leave it alone, even. Mm -hmm. AT. Would you feel more comfortable, Nicholas, yeah. because there's a stent in place doing a kiss than if there wasn't a stent in place? Yeah, obviously, yes. Ostium looks a little hazy. Yeah, but I but even there, it, I, I still would feel confident if the, okay. if the imaging was okay and I was able to appreciate the ostium of the, okay. of the LED, then I would not rewire yeah. And, yeah. and let it alone. I'll take the next wire. I'm going to rewire the LED now and then we'll sure. I mean, I guess sometimes it depends on the density of the struts and angulation of the ostium, Gosh. what what stance you use. I mean, you want to image uh, this limb first, Carla, mm -hmm. uh, Julian. Why don't you had we a do this before we before we mess with the LED with Megatron, Let's just for example? Okay. Take a picture of the circuit. Yeah, so make sure the circuit is okay. It's an and impressive the bit of technology, and, then, and, and one of our weaknesses with dealing with, with the ostium mm -hmm. is having that radial okay. strength, uh, having the visualization of where we're going to land the stent. Maybe we and can then, do a uh, again. making sure that we get a good sustainable result. And I think sometimes our very lightweight stents aren't able to achieve that long term and we get early failure. I agree with Julian. This is where the Megatron comes in, huh? Yeah. But the, I mean, of course, the density of the struts is higher. So I, my kind of point with the bifurcation is you're, maybe you, there's a bigger need to do a post dilatation of the side branch with the Megatron particularly at the front end, you know, in the first few struts. Yeah. You know, I confess okay. that I'm impressed that nobody even uh, consider to just place a stent from the ostium. I mean, it's because you are all experts in imaging, but believe me, many people would have uh, uh, used this as a strategy. Uh, and of course, it doesn't work because in acute angle, it's a narrow angle, but also because there is disease in the left main that with the OCT was a... Uh, very clear. Hmm. 
Hmm. So now we're gonna, we just did the OCT run. And um, you can see quickly you have a beautiful lumen there. Yeah. Let's, let's see approximately what, yeah, what's happening with that. Messing the front edge. Difficult to judge the osteum, however, with OCT. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah, there's a the second one. Oh, you, you, you can see it right here. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you got it. The question is, is it big enough to, uh, well, it's I would, big enough. I it goes to the media the and it's not big enough. <laughs> there's a few <laughs> nodding heads right. here. <laughs> we, are, we are a bit more lenient if it's a proximal dissection because you have a stent in front of it, right? Yeah. So the propagation is much less likely. Yeah. But yeah. having said that, if it goes into the media. It goes into the media. I think I we think need to cover need that. To cover it. Yeah. yeah. So we'll do a, a, a 4 uh, But first, eight. could you um, take me to the LAD bifurcation? Yeah. I just want to see what the strut looks like there. Now it becomes it important in. because if you cover it with another stand. I know, that's why I want to look now. Yeah, I agree with you. So let's see what we got. So before I do anything on the bifurcation, I'm going to rewire the LED and image that, see what's going yeah. on. That's, a, that's okay. a great call, Richard. I think that's yeah. think ahead rather than have an issue with a double jailed wire and potentially mm -hmm. a double jailed bifurcation. But I mean, presumably you, you should be able to put a very short stent into the LED, into the left main, sorry, proximal to the LED. I think so. I think the left main is more than eight millimeters. Yeah. You can also measure that by with your OCT, by the way. Mm -hmm. Correct. How long is the left main in order that to be to be sure put that you would avoid one. another put a marker on this one. crossing into that circle? Just put a marker on it. But what is notable is that you've got this fantastic restoration of um, compliance in the vessel. Your stent is totally opposed to the wall. There isn't there's good expansion pretty much throughout the stent. So, you know, we've got a little bit of proximal edge management and, and bifurcation management, but in terms of the initial lesion, you're in a really good spot. Yeah, I think without any doubt, the shockwave did a really fantastic job at cracking the calcium so that the stent really is fully expanded. It's mm -hmm. very, very bulky at the at the osteum of that circ, which is actually a very common place, you know, for, for calcium very, very to be, common, right? Very common, indeed. And, and if you look at a lot of the left main studies, Carlo, you can see that's a point of failure that uh, the osteum of the circ is a very common point of failure for, for mace in these studies. What is your wire now, Rich? She on blue. Mm -hmm. I may switch What's for a... Can I ask you a question on the, your technique during shockwave? You know, when I see this cavitation bubble, I tend to try to uh, aspirate them because I have the feeling that having a homogeneous contrast uh, increases the, 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 the power of the energy delivered to the wall. Is, is anybody doing it or is just uh, my ob obsessive uh, methodology? It's, it's just your obsessive methodology, <laughs> Carlo. In, 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 in terms of how, how efficacious a shockwave is, the main Have thing is that the balloon is well prepared. I think that is important. And it's opposed to the vessel. There is some bench data that suggests that the balloon is under expanded and it's very compressed. You get less shockwave delivery. So actually, you know, if you have a critical lesion, it'll be less effective than a less critical lesion. So other than that, I think it is important if there is, if there is uh, not, not well prepared balloon that will have an effect, but the cavitation bubble will occur in, irrespective of how well the balloon's prepared. That's obviously one of the mechanisms of action from the, from the emitter. You have that other wire? Yeah. So I'm having a little difficulty crossing here. So I'm gonna switch wires. Do you ever I use must say that, that uh, I'm like Carlo, that I also try to remove it after uh, yeah. when I proceed with additional uh, pulses. I, I, uh, I'm also obsessive, I think. Of course. We're, we all have our issues, <laughs> Nicholas. <so. laughs> I, I, I'm not talking from a position of confidence here. I'm pretty OCD too. But I was going to ask Richard about, do you ever use dual lumens for bifurcation crossing in this setting, Richard? Do I ever use what? I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Dual, dual lumen dual catheters. Lumen catheters. Yes, yes. Because it does give you that added security, Obscure. you're not going to get any abluminal wiring as well. 
a bit of extra backup as well. Mm. It's it's certainly left main. I think is valuable. I can't remember. Did, have we potted approximately yet? Yeah, I think you did do yes. approximate yes. pot, yeah. guys, didn't you? Yeah. We did. Yeah. We did. I think I'm across now. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. good. Julian's not paying attention here. Sorry. <laughs> I was just still very impressed with the expansion. <laughs> it's a lovely still, case. So <laughs> still um, iron up the circuit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. like, <laughs> but, you know, it's not a, it's not a low risk case. It's an 89 well, year old diabetic hypertensive. It's got yeah. all the and markers. That, and that's actually that's something that's maybe not well um, touched on, Julian, with respect to procedural risk that actually the lithotripsy potentially has got a lower procedural risk because it's actually Put easier to use. Than doing OCT. Yeah, and you know, there's the risk of no reflow here, mm -hmm. potentially with other methodologies. So, mm -hmm. and, and I think it's the controllability. If you see hemodynamic instability, you can stop, you can stop the delivery of energy and let the, let the heart breathe a bit. I must say... Well, on top of that, this was a, this is an unprotected left main and they, inf they, they, provided pulses in the left main. I think yeah. this is quite yeah. impressive. This is a nice demonstration how safe really? this technology yeah. is, it even is. in left main stem disease. It is. Even in our hands, guys. <laughs> well, listen, I'm impressed that you're going straight to an OCT caster here to cross into the LED, so... No, I'm not. Actually, yeah. I'm pre-dilating. Oh, oh, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm going with a balloon. I was going to say, because I wouldn't not, do that. <laughs> I'm using a 1.25 balloon right now. Yeah, okay. Uh, it's almost cheating. <laughs> 18 down. Come back a little bit. That's it. That's it. Keep it right. Uh, a little, little further. Right yeah. I have to come back as yeah. well. Okay. 18 down. Right there. All right. Then we'll CT, see how we look. And we've still got uh, the, the front edge dissection to sort, haven't we? Yes. Mm -hmm. I, ju I just want to make sure my LED is okay, and, then we'll, uh, first, and yeah. then, we'll... then we'll go to that. Great. So sometimes, you know, um, I think Carlo mentioned that, you know, we don't see... I'm coming back. <laughs> you can't see the osteum with the OCT that well. Sometimes what we'll use is a guideliner, because the very edge of the guideliner, you can see through... Uh, with the um, OCT. OCT, and you could um, see the osteum by placing the guideliner in the osteum there. So sometimes we'll use that technique. Yeah, there's a couple of case reports on there with the, you know, obviously there's a range of guide extensions out at the moment, and I think there's a case report out on, with the telescope as well. And so it is interesting to see that. It's still a relative weakness of OCT when compared to IVIS, yes, though, isn't no it? no question. Absolutely. And we may end up, you know, we'll probably IVIS this at the very end, just to be sure. Osteo oh, disease again. Going, the no, they went there. Osteo disease. Not actually, too. we just heard no. a fantastic talk from Julian on no. osteo disease. Um, no, you're through. A little more. Which you address really. many of these points. Yeah. You want a little bigger balloon? You know, he, nice demonstration okay, of the challenges. Mm-hmm. Very okay. That means relevant. Thank you. I was waiting for the translation. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're across the LED now. Great. And we'll get an opportunity to see the left main from that view. Okay. Now, good. Actually, it doesn't look too bad. That's this a, is that's our a, that's LED. That's die, Richard, that. That's quick. <laughs> we have to wait for it to reappear. <laughs> Wonder whether you can. There's a dissection. Yeah, there. there's there's a nice dissection. Right here, oh, yeah. isn't it? Uh, we're definitely going to cover that. Yeah, but yeah. let's go to the osteum, the bifurcation of the LED in the circ. Difficult. That's interesting. Would you stent you know, main that... to LED? So here is the. Well, mm. it's not a bad mm. idea. Looks like it needs a bit of help there, doesn't it? Yes, it, yeah. I think it we certainly do, does. We should do a kiss here, I think, yep. right? Yeah. I mean, it's an interesting point made by Julian there. He's saying, would you consider converting this to a clot stent from LED back to osteum of left, left main and then recross the kiss? I think the osteum of the LED is not covered, is it? Yeah, yeah. I don't think it is no. either. Yeah. It'd be quite an eloquent way of dealing with two problems. Yeah. I think so. I think that's a good suggestion. Yeah. 
Yeah, a 12 millimeter 40. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And like it. it allows you to adjust your length as well. You've got a nice ability with the flexibility of your distal landing zone. Yeah, and you've got a straight run. I as think well. we. Might even need a 15. We need it longer than 12, guys, it's because you want to come back to... Yeah, yeah. I, I would go with a 15. So we want to be a little bit more distal to here, I think, right? Yeah. And if, even if we started here and we go all the way back to where the dissection yeah, is... Yeah, I'm going to go with 15, but I may need a balloon, to, a bigger balloon. So okay. give me Thank a 2.5 balloon. Which is here. I think a point for the audience is that if you're trying to deliver a stent through a side strut of another stent, that's not an area to push very hard. It's an area to no. make sure you prepare well. Yeah. Okay. And then let's see what is the size that we want to use here. I mean, Four you guys 15. probably told us in the presentation, but how, how old is the stand in the LED? It's several years old. It's greater than three years. Okay. Yeah, we can use, we can certainly use a 4.0 here. Mm, definitely. The, the stent itself is... So the beauty of imaging you just showed again is that you never would be able to tell angiographically that there was a problem with no struts at the ostium. And here, mm. it again, takes mystery oh, and tells you exactly what to do. <laughs> yeah, but that's you, James. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> the stent is a 3-0 three three, stent that they put in LED. So the 2-5 cross nicely, that's good. Go up to 12. Yes, oh, potentially. Yeah, okay. it, it, got, it got pushed back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it did, yes, it does, yeah. Can we go back to the Andrew? Just, just can Wait we have a... a yeah. the, Carter was just raising the question, guys, about Ready? the, yeah. the yeah. wire in the... Oh. In the in the That's proximal, good. is it the proximal edge of the stent you were concerned about it, Carlo? Column. Column. Yeah, take this stent. Sorry, I, you, you mean uh, where it crossed? Uh, which, yeah, which set, it was the crossing, or? really. So we were just four or slightly concerned about whether the crossing was within the yeah. stent, just at the very front edge. Four or fifteen? I'm not sure it'll matter too much, though, if the balloon delivers and you're putting a second stent. Yeah. But it probably does explain why it was a little bit trickier to deliver. To wire it. Yeah. So now we have a 4015 stent. Okay, let's see if this crosses. Yeah, so nicely backed out there. Mm -hmm. That's it. So this Medtronic, the stent starts a little inside that. I think this is area. good, right? Let me see. I think that's yeah, good. That's I like it. Go up to 12. Not much prevarication there. <laughs> yeah. So I see you trust 100% of your imaging. I mean, I could normally go left cranial to just have uh, an angio puff uh, and, and confirm the position of the proximal end of the stent. But uh, you just do everything imaging guided, etc. Yes. We, we try not to move the camera because once you move the camera, obviously your angles are off. So if we leave it in the same angle where we did the imaging, we have a pretty good roadmap for the vessel. Mm, interesting. Of course, you know, again, yeah, from, the, from an audience okay. perspective, okay. That, Let's do a, we'll that, do a part. that front end of the stand is very vulnerable until okay. you do that you have proximal a, position. A 4 -0. Yes, that four and, and, and with two wires, you know, as you mentioned mm -hmm. earlier, this is a real jeopardy moment. Well, it's just like your talk, uh, Julian, isn't it? That at yeah. a point, if you you need to be very careful that the you don't come into the front edge of that. Uh, and a wire gel between two stent struts is going to be even more difficult. So yeah. back it well out. I'm sure yeah. we'll see a great demonstration of that in a second. We need no. We need a short one, like a four four oh eight. Mm -hmm. And can I have another Xion. Actually, I'm going to wait till I pot, and then I'm going to switch out this wire for Xi'an into the LED. 
yes. just to get that out of there. Um, so right now we're just going to uh, optimize well, yeah. the osteum of the uh, left main, and then we'll rewire and uh, kiss, and then image. And mm -hmm. again, we always try to image uh, both segments to see that we have a good result. Sounds great. Yep. So easy to miss the front edge of the stent as well, isn't it? All right, exactly. Yeah, that's it, that's it. Keep it right there. I got to pull it back a little, I think. Okay. I think you got it. Good. Okay. Okay, good. So now let's rewire the circ. You have another shield? It was a bit more work than I anticipated, frankly. It's all good. It's been very educational. Um, it's very interesting to see the terrific result from the shockwave in that vessel. It sort of transformed that into the easy part of the case. And then it, yes, that was honestly the easy part. It was always looking like you're going to have to convert it into a clot in the left main, I think. It's just that you were pushed into it by that proximal edge dissection. But ultimately, <laughs> if you had left it, you'd still have that uncovered bit of the LED and you know, obviously critical territory and so on. So I think from the patient's perspective, it's going to be a great result. Mm -hmm. So I, I took my uh, XT out and I just put my Xeon back in the LED. It just makes me more yeah. comfortable having that in there. And now I need you to need rewire. Another, wait, I need another okay. Xeon for the uh, CERC. Do we have another Xeon? Can I have yeah. one more? I just like having that wired down. It gives me a little more comfort. Mm. And actually, uh, unlike 99% of people, you're actually pronouncing it correctly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he uses so many of them, it would be a shame if he couldn't pronounce yeah. it. I know, but he wouldn't, <laughs> he, he wouldn't be the first. <laughs> but I don't say it as elegantly as you do. You need a little British accent. Right, I'm from East New York, not East London. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've got you've, it's multicultural here. We have Italian, Dutch, English, and Irish, as well as you guys. So we're, we're covering all bases. All right. So, well, what kind of uh, what sizes you guys suggest for the pot balloons? Nicholas, what are you, you going to do here? Take the other one out. Which well, is, is this eight. a seven French or a six French system? It's a seven yeah, that's it. French, I believe. Looks, looks at least seven, seven French. Seven yeah. French. Yeah, it's a seven. Okay, okay. so, so now we have wires be... down both. Okay. So two, okay. Uh, two three O's? At least three. Two three O's, I think. I was, I was going to go two three O's if you guys think yeah, that's yeah, good. At least two three O's, I would say. Yeah, I would go for a four and a 3.5. Yeah, I'd have gone two two three fives. Two, three, five, so let me open NCs. the strut first of the sir. Two, three, five NCs, like by like fifteen or something like that. And, 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 and like actually, that, uh, you have a two -a balloon or something on the table. It's worth reminding Let's ourselves this is a left dominant circ, so it's it's uh, you know supplying <laughs> essentially exactly. a, probably a bigger territory than the LED. We have one. You have something to open up the circ. Yeah, we'll have it right now. If for whatever okay. reason so, I would have been working in a six French, I, I would have even used compliant, semi-compliant balloons because I would use uh, invasive imaging afterwards anyway. And then yeah. that could still right. uh, increase my aggressiveness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, you know, I do femoral um, much more than most people on the planet. <laughs> and because um, I, I do a lot of um, bifurcation lesions and I just, and I use a lot of atherectomy. I just like having seven French and I know you could do it radially, but you know, um, I have 95% same day discharge with our angioplasty with femoral approach because I image and I know I have a good result when I'm done. So um, I do things a little differently, but we get good results. So Yeah, yeah. Now, I think the, the seven French does give you a, a lot more comfort when you're mm -hmm. doing, yeah. you know, complex oh. bifurcations or obviously CTOs. But I think you can do them in small ladies, a seven French fairly easily. We had a 50 kilogram lady this morning, yeah. seven French. And uh, using balloon tracking, tracking up the radial yeah. artery and all With that. With balloon tracking, yeah. 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 But you haven't been in Long Island recently. There are no small ladies. <laughs> <laughs> well, they could be short. On the outside, they may be. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's all right, go we'll take the three fives. It's interesting, Which one is this? The, you know, the Three fives, they're both radial. the same. 
There is a Atlantic divide. Mm. But with a loop in, in the Need US, the, the numbers are increasing yeah. rapidly as well. So. Uh, oh no, almost everybody's right. I'm I'm an outlier. Almost okay. everybody's radial. But uh, well, Rich, there yeah. is an interesting study going to be presented at, at EuroPCR. It's the color trial, and uh, they are comparing seven French femoral versus seven French radial for complex PCI. Mm -hmm. You know what the problem is, is that I do several thousand cases a year femorally, and if you have someone who's mostly a radial operator trained as a radial uh, person, their femoral technique might not be the same as some, you know. Exactly. Maybe That's the radial paradox. Yeah. 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 Well, we yeah. saw that but, in our own know, training, Nicholas, didn't we? When, when we, you and I and Carlo and Julian started as femoral operators and then switched to radial operators and probably would struggle going back the other way. Do mm -hmm. struggle. Life is a struggle, guys. <laughs> Doesn't sound like you're struggling too much with that restaurant, Alan. I'm just uh, chilling here, watching Rich work, man. That's what I do all day long. It's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're enjoying it as well. Okay. Yeah, you take the third. Right. You ready? All right. Why don't you go up first? I'm going to go up first. OK. I'm at 18. OK. That's it. Yeah. Done. All right, I go up. It's a little, that's good. 18. Good. Down. We'll go up to 80. 12. 12 each. Okay. One, two, three. Is 12 that... on both. Cine. Okay. Yeah. Are you going to make good. your count sort of multinational there for us in Italian yeah. or Spanish or Dutch even? <laughs> Now we'll image, and hopefully we have time to show you imaging Great. Okay. both vessels. Yeah, no, I, I think it would be good, be good to see that. Looks like you're in a happy place now. And so yeah. this is what, number five and six of OCT run? Um, glad you've been counting, Julian. Yeah, I think we're up at that level. Yeah, um, yeah which... we'll, stop count we'll stop counting here typically. But it doesn't matter, does it? Saline. Yeah, with saline, I think that's been one of the really impressive bits we've been i think none of us yeah. have felt you're compromising very much in quality there what about doing a pot at this point for five five go you want to do a five or pot why don't we do I, an imaging let me image we'll see what we have we yeah. can if we need to so, okay. so I think this is important, Carlo, because I, I know for, in theory you would say, okay, you always follow the kiss with, by a pot if you can, mm -hmm. but this is the but there is always a risk to a pot as well because mm -hmm. don't forget it's a calcif heavily calcified lesion. If you're post dilating aggressively, the calcium can pinch and you can end up with a with a tamponade. So I, I like this approach. You do the kiss and then you do you reassess by imaging. Image, yeah. And if it looks good, everything is well opposed, you are done. You don't need a pot. Yeah, and it's not only that, uh, Nicholas, it's also if you get the position of the pot balloon wrong, you can actually make yeah. a real mess of the bifurcation. So, so there is a so hazard. It's nice here. My OCT catheter cr crossed very nicely there, which always makes you feel good. Yeah. And honestly, guys, when you think about it, after after okay. doing a kiss, you might be a little um, asymmetrical. But what Go really ahead. matters is the minimal stent area. Have to start it up. And so we'll so, do quick two OCT uh, runs for you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm not sure it matters that much. How about yeah? Mm -hmm. Now. <clears throat> I was a little late on the injection there, but I. Uh, Here's our osteal cirque. Certainly not perfect. It's not perfect. No. no. It looks like this stretch from the LED impinging into yeah. the cirque. Yeah. Right. Let me quickly look at the LED and see what that looks like. I think it's sometimes it's easier to see when you take the stent software off. It's sometimes a bit confusing. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Mm. Yeah, the, the struts. Absolutely, I usually do I'm that. I'm not sure they were real. <laughs> it's hard. No, the, it did look right. like there were struts at the ostium. Yeah. It doesn't fully make sense though no. how this is 
happening, right? Well, why would that happen? No. Because things crossed easily. We didn't mangle anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We did the no, kiss. Let's take another look. Let's see from the other angle. Make sure your wire is down enough in the LED. Mm -hmm. yeah. Unless you wired behind, but you wired the third behind that last stand. Yeah. Interesting. That's a possibility. Yep. But the balloon crossed kind of easily. So. Yeah. 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 Let's have a look. Okay. I think that's Let's literally the only explanation, isn't it, Nicholas? Mm-hmm. Now, okay, that looks, that looks, that looks cleaner, good, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. We're going to go back to the CERC. Um, I did saline. I'm going to do a contrast, see if I get a clearer run on the CERC. Yeah, that, you, I mean, so that looks pretty no, damn no good. No issues yeah. with your LED, you don't think? It's just no, I'm going to go back to the CERC. A bit, bit of minor proximal malposition, is there? Maybe yeah, not. A little bit. Maybe not. Yeah, there it is. You can see it. You can see what's happening. That strut is not opposed. It should be. There is a gap between the ostium of the circ and that stand. See well, that? There's the circ up there. That looks pretty good, the ostium of the circ. Yeah. You see well, that? Well, the ostium looks, looks good, but, but your struts from the LED need to be pushed against the wall. They're not pushed against the wall. So. Hold this for a second. This is, this is a new carina with a stand. And it's a you're saying that the struts and the and the LED are, are, are doing what, Nicholas? They are not opposed against the left. So, so you have protrusion. So the stents coming from the LED yeah. into the left main, and then they are not opposed to the left main. Yeah. There's incomplete stand up position. Let's, let's, let me, maybe, yeah. we would, maybe we should do a, Why don't we do a pot? Let me just look at the circuit again, and then we can right. pot the left main. We'll see. Maybe that will take care of some of that. I Get think so. Yeah, I'm just going to do the circ again with contrast just yeah. to get a clearer run. The LED wire. wires back up it as well. Yep. I'm just going into the circ here right now. But I think what you might need to do is a 4.5 balloon in the, from the okay. LED into the left main. To the yeah. left main. Okay. I think your LED, as you say, your left main needs a, a bit of proximal tension, doesn't it? Okay. Let's get a better look here at the circumflex. Go ahead. Okay. And it's interesting how angiographically you wouldn't suspect anything, right? No. If you if you wouldn't do imaging, it would look perfect. So now the circ doesn't look as bad, guys. No. no, it doesn't. I did a better run. I always say, as I said before, a bad OCT run is like, uh, there. yeah, yeah. That's an. It looks like a nodule almost. Maybe it is the LED. Maybe we should just let take this. Let's, yeah. It is. I don't think that's the LED. I think that's a nodule. Mm. Not seen it that well, the, but I guess we're, we're slightly concerned about whether there's been an abluminal crossing here. Yeah. <laughs> Just there. Yeah. This shot's below on there. Mm. So maybe another kiss with that kind of rearrange things a little better. Yeah, I think you. I'm yeah. afraid that that if you if you inflate a balloon from the LED into the left main, that you have to recross the circ and it's then do a final right. kiss. Yeah, and that's where your dual lumen might be useful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think if we went, you know, if you if you do the recross of the dual lumen, you can't go up luminal. I think it's just almost impossible. And uh, people talk about the use of dual lumen casters and the, the concern about expense and stuff, but you know, this is a high value intervention that you guys are currently doing. So if you're gonna spend your money, that's a, that's a decent place to spend it. Okay. So uh, what would you suggest here, going in and potting the left main with the LED with a four or five? That's what I would do, yeah. And then rewire yeah. the circ, final kiss. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what okay. I would do. Yeah. Can, can we, we do have that? a four, five, 15 million or 12? Carlo, what do you think? You agree? 
Well, I still don't fully understand the mechanism. I, I guess it's more to do with the cell you crossed. Maybe you pushed some of the struts down towards the cell and you get this roof of metal, which doesn't look so nice for some reason. Also, the ostium of the cell that looks so nice in the first pullback before stenting the LED now is much more compressed. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it, it's, the mechanism is probably wiring into the LED and lifting the stent abluminally. You know, you've wired abluminally into the LED and then the balloon has distorted the stent at the ostium of the circ. So I think that's the likely mechanism. Because if you, if you look at the last OCT from LED to left main, it's pretty pristine. The LED is, is fine, the, yeah. the ostium is fine. As you say, Carlo, when we did the OCT in the you circ like alone, yeah. The Austin was fine, yeah, and good. actually, we all commented how or maybe go, go know, forward, how well expanded it was, just, and how there wasn't the modular a little better. But I think uh, okay. here we've kind of sort of essentially deformed the Austin with the cert because the wire is going to go outside the lumen yeah. of, of the stent. Hmm? So I think you, you, come, you know, come back a little bit. I don't think there's an easy the way box. to yeah, yeah. Um, undeform it without rewiring it. You have to, you have to essentially get that as much of that metal out of the way as possible. So we um, used a four five balloon in the left main just now. And that, that, went, LED. That, that went nicely through into the LED. You know, this is October no, study, it's, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Looking for distal proximal yeah. crosses, yeah. using OCT imaging to confirm. It's hard. It is, it is, and actually there's a study in Europe going on at the moment so you want guys, to in the steer, New York yeah, where the steer. there is a sort of systematic OCT at oh, each step of the steer. bifurcation. And I think the suggestion from the early data is that the abluminal wiring might be a lot higher than we think. It might be as much as 20%, something like that. Is of course, if you don't so do it with imaging, you just I don't just know. Recourse. Okay, so I recross it. We're going to do another kiss, okay? Would you consider <laughs> imaging at this point first to confirm where your recross is? Sure, that's a good idea. Let's image the sir. That's a great idea, actually. And, and I think if, you, if we really want to be understand the mechanism, looking at that first OCT into the LED is probably where the money shot is here. The first OCT. The first OCT that we asked, did yes. into the LED. Exactly, because you All used right. a very small balloon, didn't you? And then you did the OCT. Yes. Mm -hmm. That one. Correct. All right. Well, uh, we'll do this run and then we'll go back. Okay. Correct. Well, it's encouraging. I crossed with an OTT just yeah. now, so I like that. Mm-hmm. Okay. Assume contrast. The other thing about OCT, you have 15 seconds, so you have plenty of time to get set and adjusted if you're not perfect. Now. Okay. Let's see what we got. If we could take the struts off. All right, so let's go back to this one area right here. Yeah, that's where the. That's your money shot, isn't but it? But I think we are. I'm in the lumen there. Right okay. place. Yeah. So oh, yeah. if we do a, a, yeah. a kiss now, we should yeah. be in good shape. Yeah, exactly, right? exactly. So let's go back with the three five or the two three five and see that we. And let's look at the left main while we'll. Bit of noise there, isn't it? Yeah. Chatter. Okay, that looks good. So yeah, we'll that looks good. I think probably don't don't a decent sized. Um, a decent size NC in the circ as well. I think you, you do have you do have a plenty of scope for. Uh, Maybe we should do that first. Actually, I like that idea. Let's do a four o. Do uh, you have a four o NC? Let's. Yeah, but that. I want to put something in the LED so that this okay. way, if we pinch the LED, we don't have to worry well, about crossing. Okay. So let's put the three five into the LED. I'm going to put a three five in the LED, a four o into the circ, and I'll pass the LED. Um, distal and we'll do the circ first. Mm -hmm. So do you have a three so five? We need the three five first. And I think when we get a moment looking at that OCT run, the first LED OCT run would be very yes, interesting. Can, Craig, uh, can you find us the, uh, where is he? Craig, can you find us the first uh, the first OCT run that we did in the LED after the two old 3, 5, 12 is fine. 
Yeah, she's giving me, giving me a new 3512. Just, I'll take it. No, I'm going to take that. Okay, and then we'll need a 40 for the circ. Very interesting, informative educational case. It's, uh, it, you know, I think if you try to minimize the complexity and take shortcuts, unfortunately, you know, it comes back to bite you. And uh, it's been a real, uh, very interesting watching every step, Julian. If you didn't have the imaging, I mean, yeah. you'd think you'd done fine. Yeah, and exactly. what would happen is the patient I mean, would come back early. Yeah, exactly. Look at that angiogram. The angiogram looked perfect yeah. result. Exactly. Not only would they come back early, they would come back early. Okay, in the so box. I'm going to place my LED over here. Now we'll put the 4 0 in the circ. Thanks for staying with us, gentlemen. Thanks for your advice, by the way. No, not at Very all. useful. So this, this is the run. Uh, can we we're going to run the run? Uh, LED. Coming, yeah, yeah, that's it right there. Mm -hmm. This is how it looks from the. Uh, we're not seeing LED. it at the moment, guys. We're just seeing the Andrew. If you could put oh, the OCT up, the sorry. OCT up, please. Go large. And go main screen for the OCT for us, please. Can you, there you uh, go. Here, here we go. go. Yeah. I think there, there was a run so there. You here. can see that you're very close up Lumley if you're not up Lumley there. Just there. Hard there. to tell, right? I, here? Yeah. Maybe. It's hard to say because you look, you're looking yeah. at the circ, right? You're hard looking to say, at yeah. the. Yeah. from the LED, so yeah. I don't think it's... What's not, interesting, it's my 4 high-pressure balloon there's flew a, across... One second. Yeah. The 4 high-pressure balloon flew across the circ there. That's... Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. I think these surrogate markers of crossing are... I mean, they probably alert you to problems before we had Ready? this kind of nuanced mm -hmm. imaging, but they, I'm not sure that the, how reliable they are to, to base your... Difficult to put that side of that osteocirc to one side and say it's a non-issue, isn't it? Those fly-through views you see on OCT mm. might be helpful here. Mm -hmm. You want to do a kiss with these two? I'm just going to do. Okay. I'm going to kiss. Just we'll kiss. Yeah, let's love. go up separately with yeah, the LED. With this, and then we'll kiss. The yeah. problem identified. Come back a little bit. Problem solved. Go. Let the LED come back a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. It just get this find. guy. Okay. Okay. Good. No, no, wait. Sorry, this was this didn't go. Okay. Can we have? We need more contrast here. Are you using saline so for just, your balloon <laughs> inflations as well? <laughs> so we're just going to uh, inflate the LED, then we'll kiss, and then uh, see what we got. Yeah, we should be in business then, hopefully. I hope. Okay. Okay. No. Okay. Okay, go negative, go negative. Okay, now go up. Ready? Yep. So one more. Okay. Yeah. All right. And then so we'll just do a low do inflation, a low kiss. inflation kiss. Back with the LED yep, I'm more. trying to without pulling the guide in. Advance that. Okay, good. You like that? Yeah. Go to eight. Eight? Yeah. Okay. Over there. Okay. Let's see what we got. Do you think the, the new OCT caster is, is a big change, Richard? Because at the moment it's not yeah. that easy to deliver. So I so the the new there's the first OCT catheter, and the second one is what's what we're using right now. What's nice about it is that the shaft is stiffer, and the um, you, it's easier to load. And it really was a big advance. It's only 23 millimeters from tip to to lens mm. instead of 28, so we can go distally. And the lens marker is the lens marker is right on target with um, the cross sectional. 
And it really, it's, the, the body is much easier to cross into a circle or tortuous lesions. Um, it doesn't feel like a wet noodle, that's for you know, sure. No, it doesn't. It really is a significant <laughs> the, the, yeah. the, the new software, the new software, the nice thing about that is in addition to getting luminal gain and stent apposition, it's going to look at calcium. So, I mean, it's really going to make OCT much more user-friendly for people who haven't used it for whatever reason. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, I'm looking forward to the new caster. You refer to it as like a wet noodle. We think it's like posting an oyster. It's uh, yeah. not, not, not the Just easiest like to work with. The other thing I like about it is that the um, the lens is basically on the marker. So yeah, the, no, way, the way we co-register here, we actually don't go through the co-registration mm, steps, which that. is basically Carlo, the angiogram. Carlo, do you co-register with the regular co-registration? We just use the, the we lens just marker. The lens marker, right? I and call it the poor it, man's. It's yeah. literally on the marker, right? So it's so easy to well, this is the LED. It's a lot quicker as well. I've certainly okay. noticed that. Yeah. 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 yeah, you can see how many OCT runs we do in a case. If you co-register every time, okay. it's taking a lot of, you mm. know. Okay, go ahead. Okay. And geographically, that looks great. It does. That looks, looks, wow. looks much more promising, much doesn't better. it? Yeah. Yes. So far, so far, so good. Yeah. Now do the circ. Take the OCD. Now I'm going to quickly do the circ, but that looks nice. Wow. Yeah, that looks that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Look good too. Yeah. Well, that's a bifurcation. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, took, it took it took five of us to do this case. <laughs> Four and a half. I'm sorry. I haven't always been here. Yeah. <laughs> Julian's still looking at the result from the from the litter trip. So yeah. <laughs> I've reported. <laughs> But it's been a very educational case, guys. So, you know, big thanks to you and the team. And that uh, you, you, we can see how efficient you are at using imaging and how, how, how fundamental it is to what you do, which is really valuable for our audience to see that. Now, all right, let's see what it looks It doesn't look perfect, but hopefully looks, it looks better than it, looks it was. It a lot better, yeah. It's, yeah. yeah. Better, yeah. Uh, Better, this yeah. is Better good. Chatter. This is a good result. Mm -hmm. yeah. I would be yeah, happy that with this. Crossing made a difference. Yes. Massive, massive, massive difference, great. actually. Massive difference. Massive difference. Yeah. Yes. Looks good. That's brilliant, guys. I presume you're you're done now, are you? Yeah, we're going to go and have had, some. I think we had enough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll leave Julian well. with you, but we'll say. <laughs> big, big, big thanks to you and the team, and a big thanks to Nicholas and Carlo for their expert assistance. Really fascinating case, and great to see such a well-oiled team working in, in, in motion together. So big congratulations, guys, and Keep, thanks for diving thanks, in. Guys. Take care. Bye. Bye, bye. That was a great case. Uh, a lot know, of learning points. A lot of learning points, and you know how Shockwave dealt with that osteal circumflex calcium. I mean, it was phenomenal. Mm -hmm. It seemed to, at that point, the case seemed done. And then, of course, the imaging brought in a few nasty surprises. And the aorto osteal as well. So, you know, I, I think we can never underestimate these lesions. He's an 89-year-old gentleman. There's a lot of jeopardy. It's a live case, which also adds a little bit to it. But, you know, as a demonstration of how the technology is working, it's fantastic. And then it just brings out the challenges. There's already a stent in the LAD. How does that impact on your stent from the left main to the circumflex? Working it out, how are you going to cross over? All of it, great. Yeah, and I think also, Julian, if you think about it, you know, one of the, we're, we think of Shockwave as a democratizing technology. It basically allows the less experienced operator to treat complex arterial calcium. But I think it's worth remembering that doesn't mean that you can all of a sudden treat bifurcations without every step being done appropriately with the care and attention. I think if we hadn't done imaging in that case, potentially we'd have introduced jeopardy into that patient. Yeah, I mean, it's a great, obviously hugely experienced, and the way they use imaging to drive the next step, looking at the imaging, trying to understand what it's showing, learning from that imaging to then drive what they're going to do, what balloons are they going to take, is there an issue, is there a problem? Oh, wait a minute, yes, there is. How are we going to resolve this? Yeah, and I know I, this is one of my hobby horses, but I think if we're going to do left vein bifurcations, dual lumen casters perhaps is a good way to go as a systematic step. You can't wire a Bloomley with a dual lumen caster. It's just not possible.
I mean, it's always the same. It's, uh, is there a shortcut that we can take? Yes, but there is a jeopardy of taking those shortcuts. And we've seen this so many times, haven't we? Absolutely. So I think, you know, it, as you say, it was a very instructive case. Shockwave really delivered on, on its promise, but at the same time, bifurcations require care and attention and every single step is important. Carlo, let's hear from you now on the subject of treating eccentric calcific lesions. Thank you, James, for this uh, interesting, quite novel subject. I think uh, we have learned from the 648 uh, patients in the patient level pooled analysis of the DISRAP trials, how this uh, device is effective and safe in this type of lesion. And we are not speaking of type A or B1 lesion. They were up to 40 millimeter long besides being heavily calcified lesions. So uh, what about uh, the exclusion criteria of this trial? Left main disease, presence of uh, uh, under-expanded stents, uh, CTO, vein grafts, uh, ST elevation myocardial infarction, or longer, more tortuous uh, lesions in distal vessels. Uh, our moderator have uh, 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 shedded light on some of the subjects, for instance, uh, under-expanded stents. You see here a, uh, a report uh, from 13 patients uh, showing that uh, you can increase uh, your MLD by more than 200% inside a previously unexpanded stent applying uh, lithotripsy. Let me share you a case that uh, joins uh, this uh, issue with uh, the treatment of an acute ST elevation myocardial infarction in a 67 years old man, you see the thrombotic occlusion of the third segment of the dominant right coronary artery open up with a wire and a two balloon. It looked reasonably well expanded. I think most of us would go with a stent, but as occasionally happens, in this case, we were punished by incomplete expansion. You see this very eccentric residual stenosis. And when you try to go with a, a shorter high pressure balloon, you have this typical dog bone and lack of expansion. Ultrasound shows the problem. Very small residual lumen within the stents of less than two square millimeters. And the slightly uh, larger than 180 degree plaque on one side of the vessel, very calcific, that doesn't expand. That could be a nightmare in the old days. Nowadays, it's just a few pulses of the uh, lithotripsy balloon, and at that point, balloon expands, and you can expand with a properly, uh, appropriately sized balloon having uh, achieving this very large uh, residual lumen without risks of uh, perforation or rupture in the vessel. Again, our moderator has uh, reported excellent results in another setting that was not fully covered by the disrupt trials, let main protected uh, disease. And uh, you see an example of a highly uh, uh, calcified, uh, very thick, uh, uh, concentric layer of calcium with the cracks in, multiple cracks induced by lithotripsy. Often in the main disease, we have a different distribution of calcium. The calcium is opposite to the origin of the circumflex. In this case, there is also a very proximal, uh, large diagonal branch. You see this bulky calcium assessed with uh, intravascular ultrasound. So in a patient who has 25% ejection fraction, severe residual, severe mitral regurgitation, you have to use an impeller. You don't want to take chances and going with a lithotripsy balloon to obtain full expansion, also in this type of eccentric lesion, I think makes sense. A furrow balloon, 80 pulses fully delivered. Of course, the impella allows you to do it despite the totally occluded right coronary artery with confidence. At this point, you, we try to just use a super provisional approach with three balloons uh, deflated together. 
this tracing didn't uh, achieve exactly what we wanted because this large diagonal has a, a very severe osteostenosis, so we needed to implant another stent doing a, a kissing, a new pot, and this is the final outcome. The main uh, protagonist is, of course, the successful uh, rupture of the uh, eccentric plaque that you have seen at the start. So, we know that uh, uh, with uh, lithotripsy, you can make multiple cracks in concentric calcium. There is no reason that this doesn't happen also in eccentric calcium because the balloon inflated brings the energy in contact with calcium. In this specific cartoon, well, you see more ruptures and more uh, cracks in the concentric lesion and you need a bit more to uh, um, open up this thicker layer here, we can deliver more cracks and it is known that uh, uh, greater energy application induced, uh, as you can see in this example or below from this OCT image, multiple cracks. Some of them are visible with the imaging, some of them are visible only with micro CT as in this case or histology, but they do achieve a modification of the rigidity of the plaque. In eccentric uh, um, uh, lesion, you may expect that expansion of the quadrants not calcified compensate the poor response of the calcified segments. That's the reason why uh, you consider this a sort of secondary indication compared with the concentric calcium where you can't cross or you can't expand at all. Still, the asymmetrical non-uniform expansion has the potential to induce vessel deformation. The final lumen will be elliptical, kidney shape, there will be incomplete stent position, there will be flow abnormalities, there will be compromise of side branches uh, to, to expand this part of the vessel without calcium. I don't think that's ideal. If you look at the uh, imaging algorithm to tell us when we should use devices, to uh, dedicated devices to modify calcium before stent implantation, you see that you basically always need to have more than 90, 80 degrees uh, arc of calcium to obtain these two extra points, the most important predictor of lack of expansion, and then be uh, uh, forced to use a rotablator or any other uh, modality to modify calcium. Is this always the case? I mean, we, what we try to do is to have an um, uh, analysis of the cases that we have done uh, um, in, in disrupt one and two trials, and you see there were almost 200 patients, Olga Neff recently reported this data in the Clinical Research of Cardiology Journal, 47 of these lesions were angiographically, this is not an imaging, intravascular imaging study, but angiographically eccentric against 133 concentric final MLD was uh, equally good in, in both group, in fact, uh, larger in the eccentric group. And this is, was the excellent residual diameter stenosis in line with the general good result of the disrupt trials. We tried in a smaller series, but with the advantage of having uh, intravascular imaging in all cases, we reported this initial uh, series in cardiovascular revascularization medicine, but I now able to show you a slightly larger series. Uh, all the patients enroll up to August 30, up to August 2020 in the Carregi University Hospital of Florence with lithotripsy. Uh, you see a variety of indications, including 20% STEMI non STEMI, 80% uh, of multivessel disease. Uh, uh, almost 30 percent of left main disease and many bifurcations, of course. Uh, you have a follow-up of these uh, patients of a minimum of six months, an average of 16 months, and you see that uh, the deaths 
uh, toll was as low as 5.8% in this complex population, with less than 3% of them requiring target lesion revascularization. We did perform a separate analysis of all cases, having at least pre-interventional and final intravascular imaging with either um, OCT or intravascular ultrasound, and we perform QCA analysis. You see here two examples of uh, intravascular ultrasound, a nice napkins ring, 360 degrees, and OCT. Also, we consider concentric because at this level is around 240 degree uh, uh, plaque. Also, you see there are uh, segments where the plaque is more eccentric, like at this level. These were the various analyses, including if we had OCT post lithotripsy calcium fractures, and these start to be the result. The two groups, as you can see, 12 with eccentric lesion less than 180 degrees, 47 with a, a more concentric disease. Uh, average age is, of course, older than our average, 72 and 75 years, respectively. These are the OCT and IGOS characteristics with the only difference in the baseline uh, assessment in calcium lengths that was longer for the concentric lesion 25 versus 17. But uh, you see that uh, uh, vessel size, severity of the lesion before, maximal thickness with ultrasound on average almost one millimeter was similar in the two groups. Periprocedural complication, as shown already in the large disrupt uh, meta-analysis, was very low. We had one patient in which going at very high pressure after stent implantation, maybe because of all, all the insufficient preparation with lithotripsy, we had the perforation that required cover stent, but no slow flow or no reflow, no stent thrombosis within uh, 30 days. And in fact, we can confirm up to six months for the 68 patients that you have seen. Uh, Periprocedural MI is the main complication, and we were able to do in all cases uh, uh, CKMB with the same endpoint that has been shown in the trial. So that's explained a relatively high percentage that you see. No other uh, large wave MIs. These are the intravascular imaging results. There isn't much interest in terms of significance, but I think it's important to know that eccentric or concentric, you obtain excellent final stent area and diameters without an enormous greater eccentricity index, no significance, slightly worse ex eccentricity in the group starting being an eccentric lesion than in the uh, concentric calcium uh, lesion. Uh, you see that calcium fractures were somewhat less evident in the 14 cases with eccentric lesion than in the group with the concentric calcium without a significant difference. But uh, you are aware that some of the fractures are uh, um, present, but not macroscopically evident, and that, that this doesn't predict the final expansion as has been shown in the OCT analysis of the Disrupt 3 trial. Acute gain, very similar. Residual stenosis, very low in both groups. So this is uh, the analysis in terms of uh, malposition. Uh, uh, lithotripsy doesn't eliminate completely the issue, of course, having the cracks somehow uh, induce uh, the presence of some malapose struts, uh, edge dissection almost non-existing and uh, no strand fractures. My conclusion is that intravascular lithotripsy is safe and applicable both in concentric and eccentric calcification. Uh, the stain calcium fracture were not only more evident uh, in terms of percentage of cases where they were visible, but also being more frequent and deeper uh, in the plaque and longer in the group with concentric calcium. Maybe the expansion 
of the stent in the balloon more towards uh, the normal part of the wall makes them less evident uh, at the end of the procedure, but still they were there in more than half of cases. Our findings and the good results uh, in eccentric lesion challenge the OCT imaging algorithm that suggests that calcium disruption with dedicated device should be limited to the so-called 3-5S pattern. So 5 millimeter calcium length, 0.5 millimeter calcium thickness, more than 50% circumferential arc of calcium, the way uh, Ziad Ali has rephrased the original uh, Eugenio uh, means algorithm to make it more uh, easier to remember. We believe, however, we need more data before we recommend uh, uniformly the use of uh, lithotripsy also in eccentric lesion, especially in the setting that I think are more interesting of bifurcation and CTO, a subject I'm sure James is particularly interested in, and maybe he can present some data on that as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carlo. That's an excellent talk. And it's picking on a topic where I think there's a huge amount of interest in treating eccentricity. You know, why or why do we, why do you feel this is such an important area? Well, I mean, first of all, uh, I would say that around half of the uh, calcified lesions are eccentric. They tend to be more frequent at areas of bifurcation. They tend to be very frequent at, in the left main. That's already a reason to make it a, a, a subject of interest. Um, I think one point is that there is a, a, a great controversy with some operators who believe that eccentric calcium is not an issue. You can just expand with high pressure balloon. And some who, on the contrary, like myself, believe that this is not an optimal result, that getting a highly elliptical lumen at the expense of extreme uh, um, uh, stretching of the normal segment of the wall, increasing the pressure that you induce uh, to the plaque that shifts uh, uh, to close side branches originating at this level is not the best uh, solution, especially when we have a calcium modifying device as easy to use and as effective as a lithotripsy. Yeah, I mean, that's a great uh, point, Carlo, because people do ask, they say, well, you can get an ex a decent stent area if you just non-selectively overexpand the non-calcific area. So I guess the question that we have to answer in, in a research capacity is what does selective calcium modification add? And it may be that those areas that you touched on, like left main and bifurcations, are where the true value lie, particularly if you're going to put in two stents, for example. Any thoughts on that? Well, I, I fully share your point of view. I think uh, now we are too advanced to have, uh, you know, randomization of a device that is obviously effective, like lithotripsy, in uh, uh, conventional disrupt-like lesions. That, that's uh, the gold standard already. Uh, however, in eccentric lesion, I would say maybe a evaluation of uh, um, uh, comparison, a randomized, ideally comparison, with uh, um, uh, just uh, the classical high pressure balloon dilatation, since rotational serectomy is not necessarily effective in eccentric lesion, is a plea of chance whether it uh, will cut the calcium or the wire uh, bias will send it uh, towards the opposite wall. Uh, in this particular setting, I think there is space for, as you said, research and maybe a randomized trial. But let me challenge you and ask you a question about <laughs> You're another... not to do that, Carlo. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's equally interesting. And where most operators believe we don't need anything, which is CTO. So you get your CTO very often, either very eccentric in the uh, occluded lesion, or subintima, and yeah. the calcium, which is present in 70-80% of cases, very thick often, is on the opposite side. It's just good to place a stent 
and uh, expand the balloon as much as you can, occasionally perforating those vessels. You have, we all went through it, isn't it, Julian and, and James? No, is or it... is it easier to have four atmospheres and modify that calcium and obtain an excellent result that way? You know, it's a, it's a very interesting question, and I think um, we've done a little bit of work in this in the CTO space. I think our early experience is that there's definitely a dose dependency, that um, there's a there's a drop off in efficacy, which I think you described within your your excellent talk, that it does seem to be this drop off. Uh, so I think it, within the lumen, if you have eccentric calcium, you're going to expect to have to deliver more shocks to get the same response. I think within the subintima it's almost a completely different ball game. And our initial appearances, or our initial data would suggest actually it's not very efficacious. And you're still in that situation where it's very difficult to modify luminal calcium when you're in the subintima. And presumably that's just an issue related again to dispersal of uh, shock waves and so on. I'm not sure if you've got any additional thoughts on this in, within the CTO environment, Julian? I mean, it's a huge challenge for us. And we see that when we go down an image that you're right out in the adventitial wall at times and you have a brick of calcium. And the problem is, is as you described, Carlo, beautifully, you know, if we can break down that eccentric calcium and get a much more overlyzed stent, we're going to get better outcomes for our patients. We are compromising our outcomes with these D-shaped results that we're putting stents into. And you know the problem with that is if we go any higher with high pressure balloons, we will end up with perforations, and we have seen that. We were just getting back to Carlo's point and asking the question, what is the why? The why is efficacy and safety. You know, the safety is the risk of overexpansion, and yeah. the efficacy is well, do you do you get a better MSA? Because there isn't a lot of data, Carlo, that the shape of the stent matters that much. The MSA seems to be more important. Well, I fully agree, and that's the reason why there is still debate on the treatment of eccentric lesion. Having a kidney shape or eccentric lumen, is it a true issue? Uh, I think that uh, uh, it is as long as it's also smaller. And, I mean, in a way, I believe that uh, it's likely to be smaller, but I don't have a, a randomized or, or properly done comparison uh, to, to confirm it. Yeah, I think it's, it's an area where we're going to still have to answer questions, Carlo. And it's been a great session. I think your talk has really opened the, the topic up for discussion. I'd like to thank you for taking your time and providing us for your expertise today. And a great pleasure to see you as always. Thank you, James. That's about all we have time for today. Join us for our next session, Class 6, on the subject of intravascular hydripsy, techniques and efficacy assessments. I'll be joined in the studio by Margaret McIntyre and we'll be hearing presentations from Philippe Genero, Michael Hode, and Holger Neff. Thanks for joining us today. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>